morning, everyone. Morning. My name is <laughs> My name is Shannon McAmis. Um, you've probably seen my name on the emails from the Inventbrite. Um, I'm the graduate student coordinator for the Florida First Detective Program, and I'm really excited that we are able to bring a Florida First Detector workshop um, to you guys down in the Treasure Coast. Um, and you guys have been interested since this is our fourth virtual workshop. And I know we've gotten a lot of interest from Martin County since the very beginning. So I'm really excited to put on this workshop for you guys. And Jennifer, did you wanna say anything? No, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for, for tuning in today. I think you're gonna learn a lot and have a lot of fun also. So I see a lot of familiar faces out there. So welcome. Um, so I just wanted to briefly introduce the speakers and the group leaders who will be putting on the, um, the presentations and helping us lead the activities today. Um, the first is, uh, you, well, you guys probably all know uh, Jennifer Pelham. Uh, <laughs> and then we have Lyle Buss, who is the manager for the UF Insect ID Lab, and he'll be talking about um, how to take some good pictures for submitting samples or through photos. Um, later, Dr. Carrie Harmon, the director of the Plant uh, Diagnostic Center, will be joining us to talk about plant disease symptoms. And our last speaker is Dr. Amanda Hodges, um, director of the Biosecurity Research and Extension Lab and director of the Doctor of Plant Medicine program. Dr. Hodges, did you wanna say anything? Good morning, everyone. We're, we're just so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much to Shannon for organizing and thank you, to, of course, to Jennifer Pelham for her organization and work as well. This is just uh, just really exciting and uh, we're just uh, we're just so happy to be here with you. Thank you. Um, and then for those group leaders who'll be helping us um, put on activities for you guys, uh, we have Dr. Gideon Alake, a, a postdoc in the Biosecurity Research and Extension Lab. And we have Sarah Berkmeyer, a graduate student in the Doctor of Plant Medicine program. And then we have Trevor Forsberg, who uh, just recently graduated with his undergrad at UF and has been helping us out a lot on the Florida First Detector program. Um, and we're going to take a minute to go ahead and split up into the groups. Um, but just before I do that, I wanted to go over a couple of um, just kind of ground rules of how the um, workshop will flow. Uh, if you all could please stay muted while the pr presenter is speaking. Um, that way we're going to be recording these presentations and that'll just ensure that the sound quality is good for if you guys want to play back the presentation later. And there will be times for questions after each um, present presenters um, talk. So you could unmute and talk to um, ask any questions then. And then also feel free to unmute in your breakout rooms. Um, we also for questions, you could put it in the chat bar and someone could answer it in the chat bar or if no one gets to it by the time we get to questions, the, we'll ask the speaker to answer that as well. Um, and I think with that, we're gonna take a couple minutes to go into our uh, breakout rooms just to get everybody used to the format. Um, and what um, those will be the same group that you'll be working through the couple of activities with. So we'll just have a quick meet and greet with everybody. So how did that go? Very good. Wonderful. So everyone started talking in their breakout rooms. So the breakout rooms will be really important, particularly when we get to the build a bug and the plant disease activity. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks, everyone. Anybody seeing anything interesting right now with pests or diseases? Um, someone in my group has been dealing with iguanas, which I never even thought of being in Gainesville. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal in South Florida for sure. And all kinds of things, iguanas, toads, snakes, you name it. I've been dealing with just 
everything is just too wet. So I'm really looking forward to some drier weather. Um, I, I had a lot of like blossom rot on my tomatoes and, and, uh, and some of them just have not survived. So. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, you're right, Beth, that that's really going to cause problems with disease and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's been really rainy down here the past few weeks in the Treasure Coast, so I expect that we're going to have a lot of disease starting to show up. Yeah, we've had uh, we had kind of a wet uh, early fall, but it's been a little bit dry later. But, um, but yeah, well, I guess with that, um, um, we're going to go ahead first presentation, and that's going to be uh, Jennifer Pelham, and she's going to talk to us about DDIS and sample submission. Okay, let me share my screen. DDIS, it might be new to you, but you might not have heard it before, but it's actually been around for quite some time. I don't, I'm not sure exactly when the DDIS system started, but I look back at some of my uh, requests for for answers in the DDIS and I, my first request was in April of 2002 so I know it's been a while, it's been a while and that's one thing that's neat about DDIS is that you can go back and see some of your past uh, past submissions but what is DDIS DDIS is the distance diagnostic identification service so what it is, is as a user, users can submit digital samples of plant diseases, insects, weeds, fungi, uh, nutrient related problems, and they submit those to the experts and the experts will identify them for the user. Uh, once the expert, like you see Lyle here, um, he's one of the experts in the entomology insect ID lab. And once the expert identifies it, they send the information back to the user, which also includes resources about the, about the, diagnos the diagnosis. So if it was an insect, a you know, little background information about the insect, other plants that it might um, be a host uh, of, or plants being a host of for that insect. If it's a disease, they might tell you the prevalence of the disease or, or even a weed uh, if it's, commonly found in your the area or not. Uh, and so it, they provide you with a lot of great information. And um, for example, if an invasive species started to spread, we can also use the DDIS system to track the spreading uh, around the state. So it's a really useful system, not only for the user to get things identified, but also for the specialists to see where certain insects and diseases are happening. So pest Plant pests and diseases cause economic uh, loss for agriculture, for our landscapes, and for also the natural uh, environment. And as you guys know, for, for IPM, integrated pest management, the first step of IPM is correctly identifying the pest. Because if you don't know what you have, you don't know how to solve the problem. So DDIS will definitely help you with the correct identification of the pest. Um, so by sending in your electronic samples to um, the extension clientele like myself, um, or not myself, extension clientele like you, like our growers, um, some of our professional landscapers can submit samples and then that's sent to um, extension faculty who can answer their, their questions, their requests, and if we don't know, which happens more times than not, we can uh, send it up to the specialist to help get those quick identification uh, answers. Because as you know, things can happen very quickly in, uh, in the field, in, the, in agriculture, in the landscape. So we need to have those quick diagnostics so we don't cause too much economic uh, downfall for the grower, for the landscaper, et cetera. Uh, so early, early detection is super important also of an invasive species. Uh, so again, if we have an invasive species that comes in, and a lot of times the invasive species starts in the backyards of homeowners, and it can spread into our crops, into our agriculture. So you guys as master gardeners are definitely our first detectors. Uh, so finding these new things that you may never have seen before and, and helping us to find those and correctly identify them is important. 
And you see this photo of this tomato here, the Tuda absoluta. Um, it's not found in the U.S. currently, and we don't want it uh, in the U.S. or in Florida because it can be very devastating to our tomato industry. And what that is, it's actually a tomato leaf miner. So it looks like it could be a disease when you first look at that, but um, with proper identification, it is actually a leaf mine, a Lepidoptera uh, insect that, that causes that damage on that tomato. So that's um, just showing you that, you know, sometimes the symptoms that you see on the, on the crop, you know, can, it can be actually be different than what you think it could be. So why is DDIS important? It's actually a central hub between multiple different groups creating a centralized location of information. And these different groups can use that information um, as sample submitters uh, and first detectors. You can put the, all that information into the network things get identified. And like I said, we can see where problems are in a certain location in the state or if there's a new invasive pest, we can see where it's spreading uh, in the state. And, um, definitely for our cl extension clientele, it can help save a lot of money and solve problems very quickly that could be devastating to their industry. Uh, so we have um, the first detectors as master gardeners, which you are, extension clientele, um, work with the county extension to identify the problem, and that goes into the whole network. And then the labs can look into the network to find information external labs, even, uh, even the regulatory agencies like the Florida Department of Agriculture uh, can um, be tuned in to the DDIS system uh, to, help, um, to help locate certain problems and also track certain problems. So it's, it's a great platform that allows for a quick response. So what can you submit to DDIS, you can submit photos. And I want to stress, make sure they are clear photos. Blurry photos are really hard to identify. So you need to, um, if, if you need some practice on taking photographs with your phone or with a camera, uh, do so because submitting the better photos you submit, the better identification and the quicker identification that you're going to get back. Uh, so we can submit types of plant diseases, insects, plant and weed ID, which seems to be what I submit a lot is um, plant and weed ID, because I admit that plant identification is probably one of my weakest points. Um, could be a mushroom or a fungus that you find, um, even just uh, nutrient problems or physiolog physiological problems that you find on plants. You can submit that for diagnostics. Uh, any invasive species that you might find, so maybe there's a new a uh, lizard that you've never seen before. You can even submit that into the DDIS if you can catch a picture of it. And even uh, problems that can be associated with livestock. So how do you become a DDIS user? It is actually very easy. So you um, will go to the ddis.ifis.ufl.edu and you scroll down to the bottom where um, you want to, um, Accept, uh, select a user group and ex select extension clientele. Because as Master Gardeners, you are our volunteers, you are part of uh, UF IFAS extension, but you'll be extension clientele as far as the DDIS goes. Um, then you don't need to put anything for the IFAS unit name, um, but then you want to select your local extension agent. So hopefully you know who that is, who is your Master Gardener coordinator. So. Uh, select, uh, if you're Martin County, for example, you would select me. And um, once you select me, I would get a email to approve you as a DDIS user. So once you have approval, then you can start submitting samples. And what's neat about DDIS, again, there's a database of pictures in there. So you can even look for similar pictures that might be a problem that you have, or you can submit your own sample. So you can click on my DDS, DDIS. And like I said, this is, it keeps a record of all your submissions that you do. So if you submit something two years ago and you see it again and you, oh, I saw that before and I submitted it in DDIS and I forget what it was, you can actually go back to your DDIS and, and look and review it again. Like I said, my samples go back to 2002, which I didn't realize I was a DDIS user for that long, which is, which is great. 
So you click on my DDIS to begin your sample submission, and then you submit, you click on submit a sample for diagnosis. And then you want to click what you're trying to uh, get diagnosed. So is it a plant disease? Is it an insect? Is it a plant or weed identification? If you don't know, collect more, uh, click more than it could be. Like we saw that tomato, that to me, when I first look at that, I would think, oh, that's disease, but it's actually an insect. So you might want to have a plant pathologist and the entomologist look at it. Um, so you can click uh, plant disease and insect if you're unsure what the problem category is. And then you wanna make sure that you input the information to find, to, so it goes to the right extension agent. And this is important because location is, is key for a lot of problems that we have in Florida. You know, sometimes there's problems up in North Florida that's different from problems down in South Florida. And this is also important for our tracking information. So if you're coming across a new disease or a disease or is spreading throughout Florida, we wanna know what county it is coming from. So is it new to Martin County? Has it been found in Martin County before? Uh, is it something that we really need to be concerned about because it hasn't been here and it's only a, a problem in other parts of the state. So you want to make sure that you put in your name, your address, where, what county it's coming from, and then your extension agent's name and any other in, in, uh, information that you want to provide. There's, there's a um, area in there where you can type more information. So the, again, the more information that you provide, it, the easier it will be for identification. If it's an insect, what plant did you find it on? Um, you know, what time, of, even maybe what time of day did you find the insect? And, and the more information you can provide, again, is very helpful. And then the last step for DDIS is that you submit your samples or images, sorry, your images up to DDIS. And again, please make sure these are clear images uh, that we can um, identify easily. The, the better the pictures and the more pictures you submit, the better. So you can submit up to seven images and I recommend that you submit as many as you can from all different angles, if it's a plant, if it's an insect, and having something to scale beside your photo is also important. So maybe you have a quarter or uh, a penny or a pen, something that can help with the scale or even a ruler that even helps. <laughs> That's great for scale, uh, putting that beside your picture to, just to help um, with the diagnostics. So once you submit your sample, it is sent to your extension agent. So you can see here, here's some palm weevils. And looking at that picture, the palm weevil, you don't, you don't know what the size is of that. It looks like it's very small, but palm weevils are actually huge insects. They can, they can be an inch or more uh, in size. So having something in there that would help identify the size of the insect would be, it would be helpful. Um, so the extension agents can identify the sample and then send you the information. If we don't know, this system allows us to then move it forward to our specialists at the university. So we can send it to the insect ID lab or the plant, uh, plant disease diagnostic lab um, or the um, Florida uh, herbarium to help with identification. So just a note about plant disease samples, many plant pathogens can cause similar symptoms. As you know, a lot of things look alike. So it's really, um, so we may need to ask you to submit a real live sample to the laboratory. Um, so that, that's a possibility. So, and that's something you can, you can do. You can bring it into the extension office. If we don't know, we can send it up, up to the lab. So if you are going to send something off, please just communicate with our extension agent. Um, what you plan to do if you want to have further further uh, diagnostics with that. And reporting a pest in Florida, you know, it's always great. If you've never seen this pest before, don't hesitate to bring it into the extension office because you may have found something that has not been found in Florida yet. Um, as you know, we get tons of insects that and diseases that come into Florida on an annual basis. A lot of it, sometimes it's stopped at the airport or stopped in the ports, but sometimes those, those invasive species come in and um, they could pose a lot of harm to, to Florida, to Florida agriculture, to Florida landscapes. 
um, to, to us, to, to humans, to animals, et cetera. So always let us know if it's something that we can't identify or we're, we get concerned about, we can send it up um, to Lyle or Carrie and see um, if they've seen it in Florida before. So we wanna make sure that we definitely re are reporting some, the pests, especially ones that we've never seen before in our, in our landscape. And then if it's something that's of huge concern on our levels, we can, we will send it up to FDAX and DPI and let them know that this is something that we really need to be concerned about. And, and they can, um, we'll start the, the procedures they may need to, to help uh, eliminate this pest to eradicate it. So and there's some information on how to contact uh, FDAX and, and DPI also, but I would, recommend that you go through the university through your local extension office first, um, unless there has been information coming out from FDAX that they want you to contact them directly about certain pests that they've, they've found. Does anybody have any questions for me? Nope. Nope. No questions. Well, I hope you all become DDIS users. Um, and it's, it's a really great resource to use. And, and now that we're in the time of virtual learning and, and COVID, you know, instead of having to bring in the, some samples into the extension office, this is great for you guys to just be in your own backyard and sending samples in. So I expect to be approving a lot of new DDIS users in the next couple of days. Okay, we did have one suffer. question. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in the chat, it's, a, it's from Sue and it says, is there any connection between DDIS and the I've Got One app? I don't believe there is. Do you guys know? I don't think there is a, a connection to that, so. No, no, there's no connection. And um, we do have to be careful, particularly, you know, if it's something that's new, the I've Got One is not like the official channel for reporting. So the information, Jennifer, provided and going through your county office is the official channel for that. And sometimes there can be, I've got ones pretty good, but there can be some inaccurate information there sometimes. Um, and I know most of you probably know Jennifer, but I think I forgot to um, introduce her to anybody who doesn't know. And so she is the county director for Martin County and she's also the uh, coordinator of the Master Gardener volunteer in case Anybody's new. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to mention that too. <laughs> um, and our next presentation um, is by Lyle Buss, and he was going to be talking about how to take those um, some nice photos to submit to DDIS. I'm Lyle Buss. I run the insect identification lab uh, in the entomology and nematology department here in Gainesville. And I also do some uh, insect photography for the department. And so I'd like to talk to you today about uh, some tips for taking photographs for diagnostic purposes. So why is it important to take pictures? Well, the more information you uh, can uh, keep, uh, the better. You know, the cameras are a great way to document what you are seeing in the field as far as any kind of plant damage goes or uh, what kind of pest could be causing this damage. Uh, it also helps to record some of the <clears throat> surrounding information in the environment around the, the plants that you're dealing with. And uh, pictures is just a good way to keep all that information. So you don't necessarily need to have uh, you know, expensive professional camera equipment to, to get good pictures. The uh, cameras that come on our smartphones nowadays are actually pretty good and will take care of uh, a lot of our photography needs. Now it gets a little tougher when you uh, start dealing a lot with insects that are uh, pretty small. Uh, one way around that is to uh, use one of these. Uh, this is a in the middle here is an uh, attachment that you can get for your uh, smartphone and it is essentially a, a little macro lens that you can clip over the lens of uh, your camera and it gives you some extra magnification for taking, care, taking pictures of the small things and these uh, attachments are pretty cheap you can 
get them from five to fifty dollars lots of different options for different kinds of phones and they, they work pretty well now ideally you would want to have a, a nice uh, micro dissecting microscope and a dedicated camera is the best way to get pictures of of small things but you know, a lot of people don't have access to that now uh, at the county office, if uh, you do at least have access to a microscope, your cell phone can uh, still come to the rescue and you can uh, take pictures by just holding your cell phone up to the eyepiece of the microscope uh, in, in the middle here. And this actually works quite well. If you do a lot of this, you can even buy this uh, cheap little attachment that clamps onto your phone and clamps onto the eyepiece of the microscope to hold your uh, camera in just the right spot. But then that way the microscope provides the magnification and it, it, this actually does a, a pretty good job. Now for taking pictures of insects out in the field, it's uh, good to get photos of the host plant and any kind of damage that you are seeing on the plant and then get pictures of the bugs whatever life stages are present whether it be eggs immatures adults all of those things are good to record with uh, the pictures uh, another good reason for taking pictures of the plant is uh, if you're not sure what kind of plant it is those pictures can be sent to a botanist and the plant identification can actually be very helpful in uh, identification of the pest Now the most important picture to get of an insect is uh, usually from above, a photo of the entire bug, and then uh, other pictures from different angles from the side, maybe the underside, maybe some close-up pictures of different parts of the insect, like the antennae or wings can be very helpful for diagnostic purposes. As Jennifer was mentioning, some unit of scale will help uh, to see how big this insect really is. Uh, the color of the insects can be important in identification. And so having your camera set uh, properly for color balance will, will help. Uh, the background can also be important in that uh, uh, one of the hard insects to photograph would be something like this in the upper right where you have a very dark insect and you might think that uh, putting it onto a white background would be a, a good way to take a picture good contrast there but it's hard for the camera to get a good photo of this kind of situation because it's trying to account for a very dark subject and a very bright background and the pictures tend to end up on the dark side and so I may only be able to see a silhouette. And so it actually helps to get a darker background and then the camera can uh, do a better job of choosing an appropriate exposure that will get more light on the subject and more detail visible in the image. It's always a good idea to keep specimens just in case pictures aren't enough for identification. You know, with a lot of insects, I may have to see actual specimens under the microscope to really identify species. And so it's always good to retain some specimens if you can. Review pictures while you are taking them to make sure that they are showing exactly what you want. You know, make sure that your subject is in focus, that the color looks right, that the whole specimen is in the image because you don't want to get back to the office and realize that uh, pictures didn't show what you uh, wanted them to and you may not have another opportunity to get more. And then also when you're sending pictures for uh, identification, it's best to send the original image. And the reason I say that is, uh, here's an example. If uh, I take a photo on my iPhone and try to email this picture, it will give me four different options of picture size to send. 
And the best one to use is the, the largest one. And if it, it, it's especially important when the subject is only a small portion of the entire picture, which actually happens a lot with small insects. And for example, here, I had this picture of a, of a plant. And if I wanna zoom in on this flower, on a large picture, I still retain a good amount of detail because there's a lot of information in that large picture. Now, on the other hand, if I was working from the small image that was sent from my phone, you know, the two large images look pretty equal here. But when I take that small image and I zoom in on a small portion, this flower, you can see that uh, it gets pixelated and I lose detail very quickly. There's just not a lot of information there to, to work with. And so that's why it's best to send the, the biggest pictures that you can. Uh, plant identification also works well with uh, pictures. It's best to start from a distance back showing the entire uh, plant so you can see the growth form of it and then get closer, get close up pictures of the leaves, uh, how the branches are actually, the, the branch showing how the leaves are arranged on it and whether they're alternate or opposite. Uh, any kind of reproductive structures like flowers and fruit are very uh, helpful to botanists. Uh, sometimes even pictures of the bark and buds can be helpful in identification. Uh, the time of day can uh, affect the quality of your pictures. You know, I used to think that uh, taking pictures on a nice sunny day was the way to go because you just have plenty of light. But these kind of conditions tend to give you uh, pictures like on the left here where you have a lot of harsh shadows. Uh, sometimes you'll have over, uh, overexposed bright areas and you kind of lose a lot of detail. And so it's actually, much better, much better to take a picture on a cloudy day where the light is more diffuse, like in the right image here. Uh, so getting photos maybe at a time of day when the sun is at a lower angle or it's cloudy, or the sun isn't as intense, that usually gives you better pictures. Uh, fill the frame with uh, as much of your subject as you can to get as much the most detail in your image. Try to get uh, photos of uh, the surrounding <clears throat> area as well. So we can see if this plant is growing in a, you know, a swampy area or dry area, uh, that can be helpful for identification as well. And check the focus, make sure that uh, your subject is in clear focus. And uh, example of that, in this image on the right here, you see that uh, the photographer was actually trying to get pictures of those little metallic green beetles on a couple of the lower leaves. But you can see that the camera instead focused on the background, on the, on the soil. And so it really missed the, uh, the beetles. And so one way you can kind of force your camera to focus on the right level is to put your hand or a piece of paper into the picture next to the subject and it gives the camera a larger area to focus on to make sure that your subject is going to be in in good sharp focus and this is uh, especially helpful when you're taking pictures of uh, something small within the uh, your, your camera may have trouble auto focusing on uh, on a small subject in a large field of view. Uh, plant pathogens can also sometimes be identified from pictures. Now, photos of the dead plants or dead tissue on the plants is uh, usually not helpful. If you can find that margin of, of area between the healthy tissue and the symptomatic tissue, that's a great place to start taking photos. If you see some uh, infestations of small insects like white flies or aphids that could potentially be vectors of a plant pathogen, uh, get pictures of those as well. And then any other signs of the pathogen that you might be seeing, anything oozing from the plant or fungal mycelial growth can be very helpful. Again, uh, 
pictures of the environment around the plant uh, helps a lot. Uh, it will tell the diagnostician, you know, whether this plant is growing in a natural area or is in a nursery setting, in a greenhouse, in a pot, what kind of density of plants is present. Uh, this kind of information is all real helpful. Uh, here's a good example of pictures of a uh, pathogen. The left image shows some health healthy tissue as, long, as well as some symptomatic tissue all in one image. And then on the right side, we, we have a close-up view of uh, the fruiting structure producing the spores. Now, a lot of times uh, plant pathogens can't be identified from photos alone. The uh, pathologists often need to use auger plates to uh, rear out fungi for identification. But still, photos are a good way to go because they can provide some other helpful information about uh, the environment and other conditions around the affected plants. But again, uh, an actual physical sample will probably be needed for a good diagnosis. Uh, mushrooms can even be, be photographed. Uh, getting pictures of uh, the entire mushroom, uh, multiple individuals showing the variation is helpful. Uh, top and bottom of the, the cap, view of the gills underneath the stem. Uh, even pictures of the, the spores that fall out of the mushroom can be useful in diagnostics. And uh, again, the area around the mushrooms so that the uh, uh, pathologist can uh, figure out what kind of uh, medium the mushrooms are growing on. Uh, even any kind of uh, staining reactions from injury to the mushroom, like cutting or bruising can be helpful in diagnostics. I guess with that, I think I have used up my 10 minutes. And just wanna thank the authors of this uh, presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Lyle. Um, does anybody have any questions about uh, taking any photographs? If not, um, I'm going to ahead and take a couple of minutes um, advertised in the, the flyers um, uh, was a free goodie bag. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about what you guys are, will be getting in these goodie bags. Let me... Okay. Um, yeah, so you're going to be receiving a Florida First Detector Kit. Um, I'll be emailing you guys after the um, after the workshop with some more information. Um, but most likely, they're going to be shipped to your the county office, which would be Jennifer, and then you would be able to pick them up from there. And you'll just be receiving a tote bag, and in that tote bag, um, there will be a deck for invasive pest ID. Um, so kind of a guide to um, some of the common invasive pests that we'll be looking for. And then you'll also be receiving a coupon for submitting samples to both Lyle at the Insect Identification Lab and also to um, Dr. Harmon at the Plant Diagnostic Center. And, and together, this is a $48 value for um, those uh, coupons. And then we're also going to be giving you guys a um, field kit, so fanny packs. They're they're very back in style now. Um, and so each fanny pack has uh, three different vials for shipping um, uh, samples and in insect samples and in alcohol, um, where there's also going to be a, a hands lens. And then we'll give you the ethanol to also ship. And um, since we're, everything is, um, you'll be shipping them, we'll also include a tube for those shipping. And um, for those, 
those first 20 people who submit a sample to um, either the Plant Diagnostic Center or the Insect ID Lab, um, you'll receive a one of those microscopes that you attach onto your phone that Lyle was talking about, or a hand loop. And then also the county with the most participation on the exit survey will receive a hat to a random um, winner. And um, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is for those goodie bags, we need to know who was here so we know who gets a goodie bag. Um, so I'll be um, posting in the chat now during the break and also at the end of the um, workshop um, links to these surveys. The first one's just an attendance survey so we know who should get a goodie bag. And we're so we send the right number of goodie bags to the right place. And we also um, have an exit survey. So uh, that way we can get your feedback and let us know how we've been doing and how we can improve these workshops in the future. And we just really appreciate hearing any sort of feedback um, from, from you guys and what you thought of the workshop and how we can improve. And again, these links, I'll post them in the, um, in the, the chat, and then I'll also email them to uh, the people who take the attendance survey so that if you need to do it at a different time, that's fine too. Uh, Excuse me, Shannon? Yes. Uh, I'm in St. Lucie County, so how would I get my goodie bag? Um, oh, let me stop share. Um, so I will be con contacting the Master Gardener Coordinator in St. Lucie County. And um, normally, uh, I think I may have sent some to them before. And so it's just, you'll go to St. Lucie County and um, pick them up from there. But um, I'll email more details later. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, with that, uh, now it's time to go ahead and break up into our groups again. And we're going to be doing an activity on building, it's called build a bug. So you can kind of guess what we'll be doing. <laughs> and you'll have your break after the activity. So I just want to remind the group leaders to allow time for the break because we will return at 1125 to the main room for Dr. Kerry Harmon's uh, plant disease presentation. We have a couple more questions. Um, uh, maybe we'll take those now, Shannon. Would we also be able to get copies of the presentations with this information? Yeah, yeah, we'll send out um, a PDF with um, the different presentations. And with uh, the other question from Jesse, will you tell us when to look for the survey? Yeah, we'll have the survey in the chat. And so that's gonna, uh, actually you can fill it out during the break. If Shannon just placed both the attendance and exit survey. So you'll be able to access that and. You can actually return to the main room whenever you're finished with your breakout and start the survey then if you'd like. So with that, we're going to open up our breakout rooms. So I think we just about have everyone back. Uh, Dr. Cameron, aka Rosie, will be presenting today on introduction to plant disease symptoms. I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Harmon for a while, uh, 15 years, and uh, she does a wonderful job with the plant disease clinic and she can answer all of your plant disease problems. And so with that, Dr. Harmon, yours. Thanks, Amanda, has, Dr. Hodges has done a great job of setting me up there, although I'm, I'm, um, I'm not gonna promise I can answer all your plant problem questions, but I will always give it my best try. So I'm gonna share my screen. Off we go. I should have, mm, there we go. I should have um, put on the survey, the exit survey, a question of uh, who I was, not my, my real persona, but my today's persona just for fun. Then everybody would for sure have that one right. Um, today we're gonna talk about what I call dashboard diagnostics, which is what you do when you don't have a lab, which is what you folks all do well in a normal year, when we get back to a normal year and you are running the plant clinic or you're talking with your neighbors or you're in your garden club and somebody asks you, what is this? What do I do about it? And you are able to 
make a dashboard diagno diagnosis and maybe even tell them a little bit about what to do about it. And then I'm there to back you up for everything else. So let's see. All right. So dashboard diagnostics really starts with a lot of questions. We've all got questions, right? I've got a lot of questions. I need you to have questions if you're going to do disease diagnosis or plant problem diagnosis, which is really what we're going to talk about today. So the first thing is really easy. What do you see? What does it look like? What are the symptoms? And we're going to talk about those specifically. But describe in your mind or with the person you're talking with, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the leaves are turning yellow? The plant is wilting. The plant is dead. Dead's an easy one, right? And then what did they say? Meaning the person who's worried about the plant, what are they worried about? If they're not saying leaf spot, but they're saying my plant is dying because it's wilting, um, don't worry about the leaf spot. We don't always have to be sure of what every plant problem is. We just have to help them with what the plant problem is that they're worried about today. And then what do I think? Meaning you, I meaning you, right? What do I think? What, what do I know? about this plant. If you're a master gardener, you know a lot about plants just from loving plants and being excited about plants and taking these classes. You're learning a lot about plants and adding it to what you already know. So you can think, well, what do I know about this plant? And when it looks like this, what experience have I had before? What was it before? Did I know what it was before? Do I have an idea? And then what do the experts say? Consult the great Google. Be careful what you consult on the great Google. Look for stuff from the University of Florida or other universities, maybe in the South or in California that would grow, the, where the plants that we grow would be in that same kind of area. Tend to stay to government or university sites and stay away from the commercial stuff. Um, just to be sure that you're getting really good, clear information, which is not to say that the commercial stuff or Facebook or um, growersforagreenerplanet.com might not have good information, but just make sure you're getting good information from the source if you can. And then make your educated guess. We call this a hypothesis when we're talking about it in science. It just sounds fancy. All it means is an educated guess, not a wild guess, although those are more fun sometimes, but an educated guess, putting the stuff together. And then call in the reinforcements, like me, when you need somebody. Um, those can be your extension agents, it would be your first line. Ask them what they've had experience with, what they know. And then you guys can always call on me, you can send me pictures, and then the client can always send in a sample. Um, you can help them package it and help them fill out the form, and they can send us a sample if they really need to know for sure. These are your plant diagnostic resources. So this is real plant problem help. So if you've got a good idea after your training from today and from some of the other classes you've had, whether it's going to be a plant disease issue, an insect issue, nematodes, maybe nutrition, maybe it's a weed ID issue or what is the plant and then what to do about it. That's where this page comes in handy. And if you Google UF diagnostic resources, this is what you'll get. Down at the bottom, you see find your local plant clinic not too needed for you folks because you are going to be who people find when they click that link, that's for the public, and then submit a digital sample. That's to use DDIS, and I know you folks are talking about that today. So we're gonna start with the last part first. We're gonna say, if you needed to send a sample to me or to another diagnostic lab in the state, and there are several, um, you would be best served if you use a sample submission form and help walk the client through the sample submission form. The reason for this is that you can help them identify what these things mean on the form, things like symptoms. We're going to learn about that today, but the client might not know what that means. And then help them fill it out completely, or at least give them some guidance. There are similar forms for the plant um, insect ID lab, for the nematode assay lab, and the other clinics around the state. And I'll be totally honest, if you send in a sample with somebody else's form, it's no problem. We'll use it anyway, and so will all the other labs. We prefer you use our form because we ask really specific questions, but we'll always make do with whatever you can send us. The important thing is the information. Appropriate disease samples. So after we talk about symptoms, I want you to be thinking, or while we're talking about symptoms, I want you to be thinking about what would you tell somebody to bring in to you, or what would you ask them to send to me if we were trying to figure out what the plant problem was? If it's a leaf spot, well, that one's the easy one, right? We need leaves. 
with spots. So that one we can probably handle. But the best way to get that is if you send a whole stem with several of the leaves attached. And that's because having the leaves attached to the stem allows us to see a little bit about what's going on with the stem. But more importantly, it kind of keeps the leaves a little bit happier, just a little bit longer. So we get a better chance of giving a good diagnosis. Wilt disease, well, wilts often happen in the main stem, the crown of the plant right at the soil line or in the roots. So most of the time for those, we actually need the whole plant. What are you gonna do if that's a palm? Well, photos and a phone call really help with that. Being able to see it, even if they can't stuff it in a box, that's really helpful because then we can guide what kind of samples would be useful to confirm what the plant problem is. Now, if it's a small plant, it's a house plant or it's one tomato plant, then the whole plant could be dug up and we could figure out what it is to save the rest of the plants. Virus diseases. We're gonna talk about looking for the weird stuff because with viruses, that's what we're dealing with. It's just looking for the weird stuff. And it's that weirdest stuff, that weirdest plant tissue where leaves are curled up or look funky. That's where we'll probably find the virus. So you look for the weird stuff, send in the weird stuff, but nothing dead and pretty much that's all samples. Dead stuff just means I can turn around a really fast diagnosis. It's dead. But that's not really helpful to the client, is it? And then anything too big to fit in a box, a tree, a shrub from a hedge, um, anything that's big, that's not gonna fit in that FedEx or USPS box very well. For those, and really anytime somebody's not sure what to collect for a sample, just give us a call and send a picture. And you can have them do that with you first, have them show you pictures and people love to go through their phone and show you the pictures, pictures of the grandkids, pictures of their cats, pictures of their dogs, pictures of their plants. And it's those pictures that are gonna be really helpful, not necessarily the dog pictures, although we like to see cute dogs too. Remember we talked about the sample submission form, the more information we get in, the better the diagnosis will be and the faster we can turn it around. And really important things are, when did the problem start? Has it been going on for years? Is it something that started last week? And were there any bugs, especially on those virus samples? Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about how you figure out, well, is it a bug issue? Is it a nutrition issue? What could it be? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna separate biotic, meaning caused by something alive, versus abiotic, meaning caused by like flooding or nutrition imbalance or chemical. Those would be abiotic plant problems because we can help people with all of those things. Remember, we were going to talk about plant problem recognition. So for biotic caused by a living thing, you're looking at an irregular pattern of occurrence. So patches or spots over here, but not over there. It'll develop over time. And that means like weeks, months, and only one type of plant will probably have the symptoms most of the time. Um, we'll talk when we talk about insects, a few plants might have the same problem all at once, but most of the time it's pretty well focused because, well, pathogens are really picky. Most of the time they only like one thing at a time, and even the bugs, usually they've got their preference, and so they'll hit one thing first, and then when that's all gone, maybe they'll see what else is on your plant buffet. On the other hand, abiotic stuff is going to have a very recognizable pattern of occurrence. So you're going to see straight lines, you're going to see um, circles, not crop circles, though that would be an abiotic problem, that kind of thing. Something very obviously not natural. Most of the time they develop overnight, meaning in a couple of days or literally overnight. Um, and that's because things like lightning or sunscreen, the oil carrier in a sunscreen or a herbicide or construction, or flooding, those things happen quickly and their effects are going to be seen quickly. And often they'll affect many kinds of plants at the same time. So if you've had, um, well, flooding or drought, everything looks bad all at once. Maybe not all as bad, but it's going to affect many kinds of plants, not just many plants, but many types of plants all at the same time. So because I'm a pathologist, I'm gonna to wanna to talk about the disease or bug, even though I'm not an entomologist, we're gonna talk about the biotic stuff mostly today because that's what we can do something about as far as spraying a fungicide, printing stuff out. So now we need to figure out, all right, we've decided it's probably biotic caused by something living. 
Now we've got to figure out, is it a disease or a bug issue? All right. Well, with both disease and bugs, it's going to be an irregular pattern of occurrence because it's biotic, right? We already said that it was going to have that irregular pattern. For disease, you're going to see patches. And with insects and arthropods, it might follow edges or wind patterns. For diseases, you're still going to see only one type of plant with a symptom because pathogens are usually very, very picky. Whereas insect issues, bug issues might affect a few kinds of plants with the same types of symptom. And the types of symptoms we're talking about, and we'll see some pictures of these so we can talk about these words, but diseases are going to have leaf spots, wilts, cankers, blights, dieback, and patches. Whereas Bug issues, you're going to see maybe some blights or dieback, depending on if they got in and they girdled or, or killed back, a, a, say, a stem tip. You might see chewing damage or sooty mold. And those are symptoms and signs that you'll see of the, the bug issues. All right, but I'm a pathologist, right? So I work on disease stuff. So we're going to leave the bug stuff for other people to talk about. You've got plenty of other experts today, and I'm going to focus on diseases now. So if we needed to figure out if it was fungal, viral, or bacterial, the three main groups of pathogens that we deal with. The big reason to figure out if it's one of those is really to figure out if it's fungal because fungal we can deal with. Sometimes we can prune it out, we can knock back the inoculum, we can apply a fungicide. Those are things we can do to manage fung fungal problems. Viral issues, plants gotta go. There's no saving it, there's no going back. It's prevention only. And bacterial issues, honestly, in the home landscape, treat it like a viral issue. Almost no way to recover once you've got a bacterial disease going on in the plant. Sorry, I'd like to say we've got magic bullets, but even copper, while it might protect plants, so if you can prevent it, you're doing well. Once you've got a bacterial issue in your plants, there's really no going back, even in the commercial industry. So let's see what it takes to figure out if it's fungal, viral, or bacterial. So with fungal problems, there are often going to be foci, meaning specific points that you see a collection of, say, the spots or whatever the symptom is in, in groups, um, often in shaded, irrigated, or stressed areas. So places where water might collect in a lower area of the yard, you might find more fungal leaf spots or fungal root rots in your turf or in the ornamental plants that you do. Things that are closer to the irrigation might see more leaf spots than others. And then fungal symptoms are going to be leaf spots, wilts, cankers, blights, and diebacks. Viral, on the other hand, we're looking at maybe where insects would likely alight first. So sometimes along the front edge of a normal wind boundary, because the insects might be carried on wind, might follow edges and might also be in foci, depending on where the insects started and then spread from there, because a lot of insects vector viruses. On the other hand, a lot of our viruses come in on the plants we buy. So say your tomato transplants that you buy at the garden center, they may come in with a virus. We had a, um, I had a lot of samples this year on both tomatoes and peppers that came in with virus right from the beginning. In that case, it's nothing you did. It was, wasn't anything you could prevent by making sure there were no bugs. The plant was already infected when you bought it. And that's the main way we get viral diseases in the home landscape. And with viruses, we're looking for, well, weirdness, weird mosaic patterns that look like a tile mosaic, so different colors within the leaf, uh, maybe ring spots, maybe the leaves are curled, or maybe you're getting leaves where you should have flowers. All of that weirdness, we really think about with viruses. Now, other things can cause weirdness, but we, we have it as one of the types of symptoms that I would associate with viruses. We also look for sooty mold. We look for evidence of insects because insects would be vectors. And then on bacteria, again, you're looking for places that are gonna be wet. So along irrigation, um, anywhere that the leaves stay extra wet, a lot of times bacterial diseases start on the lower leaves first or those that are shaded. And you're looking for wilt, sometimes ooze, although that's a, not a real common symptom for us to see, to be honest. We always talk about it in pathology, that look for bacterial ooze, but there really aren't that many bacterial pathogens where you're gonna see with the naked eye, you're gonna see ooze, but it sounds cool. Water soaked spots, meaning it literally looks like that leaf acted like a sponge and soaked up water. It looks dark and it looks wet. And then spots with halos and the halo or the yellow ring around a small spot is often because the bacterium is 
is actually spitting out, sort of, enzymes to digest the leaf cells just ahead of where the bacterium actually is. And that's how it eats through the cells. And so that halo is where the cells have gotten sick, but they're not dead. All right. So now we're just going to look at some really pretty pictures. I like looking at the pictures at this point so that we can get our eyes trained on what we're looking for in these symptoms. So for fungal, we're looking at leaf spots. Look at that beautiful crinum leaf spot caused by cercosporidium or pseudocercospora. There's a, a several that are in that group that cause this great rounded edge on a leaf spot. Often rounded edges are fungal because fungi are bullies. They can punch their way through major veins on leaves and therefore they can grow in circles. Whereas bacteria are a little bit wimpier and they can't punch through those veins as well. And so their edges are often angular because they're, that's where the border is based on where the leaf vein is. So that's a really nice fungal leaf spot on the lower left, even though it's got a little bit of a halo. Halos are not as common with fungi, but Cercospora is cool because it produces a light um, induced toxin. So in the sunlight, which is where we grow most of our plants, Cercospora fungi will produce a toxin. And that's doing the same thing those enzymes do with bacteria. It's just making the cells just to the outside of where the fungus is growing, making those cells unhappy and turning them yellow, or in this case, bright orange. I think this one's kind of a nice Halloween look. Your top image is a patch disease. This is large patch in Bermuda grass. Now you might see this, maybe not this bad, of course this came out of a research trial, but you might see this on a golf course, especially going into the winter. So the crinum that you see in the left, that's something we see throughout the summer. What you see in the top middle, I want you to be looking for if you golf and go out on that sports turf, especially Bermuda grass that's mown really, really short, you'll see this beautiful orange edge um, that is also a fungal disease. And the little white patches are actually dollar spot. They get about the size of a half dollar and the, the turf bleaches out and dies out. Those are two different turf diseases. Now to the right, you see that weirdness of a viral disease. That's rose rosette virus. We don't have it as far as we know in a lot of established areas. In fact, if you do find it, we want to know about it. Um, it's been seen mostly on rose, on um, knockout roses is how it's been moving around primarily. But we actually haven't confirmed it out in the landscape. We keep eradicating it, or at least our State Department of Ag folks keep eradicating it and keeping it out of the state. So we haven't actually seen this very much in Florida yet. So some reminders on, oh, we've got a question. Um, I can make my, the question was, is there a handout that shows all this? I will make my presentation, this final one, available um, as a PDF so that it can be sent out to everybody as a handout. Um, and the PDF will be in color. Um, so you, don't, you won't want to print it out, of course, but you'll be able to see all the colors of these things because some of those colors are really nice. So reminders on key things to look for for fungi, round or target-like lesions or cankers or rotted roots. Look for fuzzy areas um, if you're going to use a magnifier. Bacterial angular lesions, rotted roots again, um, wilt, and look for water soaked lesions. Viral, you're really looking pretty much just at the weird symptoms. And then there's everything else that's hashtag not a pathogen. And that's you're going to look for insects, you're look for eggs, worms, frass, residue that indicates that something might have been sprayed for those abiotic plant problems. Yep, oh, I clicked on that chat again. All right. There we go. So if you're going to try to capture what you're seeing so that either you can tell somebody else how to do it, um, capture the image and send it to you or so that you can send me a picture so that I can help you with a plant problem. In the lab, we'd use a microscope. And so if you're in your plant clinic and you've got a microscope, you can actually put your phone right up to it. But of course, any which way you can capture symptoms is going to work really well. If you've got a microscope, I highly recommend learning to use it. You don't need to use the compound scope very often, but the dissecting scope, that one on the left where you put the whole plant piece under the microscope, those are nearly indestructible and tell you almost everything you need to know about whether it's fungal, bacterial, viral, or not a pathogen right off the bat. And most of the time, I'd say nine times out of 10, that's all your client needs to know. 
This is actually what I use all the time. This is a clip-on microscope. Um, it's got a little light built into it. And I use this all the time. Um, it's about seven bucks on Amazon. I don't get a kickback from it, but I use these all the time. This gets it just close up enough, again, to be able to say fungal, bacterial, viral, insect, or something else. Again, in the field or in the office, this is enough to get you about as far as you need to go for a home client. Once you know what it is, what you do about it, you're gonna to go to EDIS. You're probably going to ask your HORT agent, whoever is coordinating your sessions, and you can always ask me, but also typing into the great Google EDIS, E-D-I-S, the name of the plant, say tomato, and then the symptom, leaf spot. And you'll actually get publications, if we've got anything on it, you'll actually get publications about it that'll give you pictures, tell you when the disease or the disorder might occur and what you can do about it. So it's now your turn. So in the chat, which I'm going to kind of hard to keep open and do the presentation at the same time. So is this, do you think a regular pattern or irregular pattern? Let's talk about pattern recognition and then we're gonna try and figure out what it is. Irregular. Irregular, absolutely, thank you. It's irregular, so it's probably back then. And do we think this looks like it could be fungal, bacterial, or viral, or a bug? Fungal. 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 You're right. I'm guessing you have a clue. You think you might know what this is. What do you think this is? Leaf spot. Sunshine. It is a leaf spot. That's the symptom. Absolutely. Does anybody know what the plant is? Sometimes knowing what the plant is. Spath of nope. Not spath, but that's a really good, that's a really good guess. This one's not spath. This is one, it produces a flower that's often in the pink canna. or red. It is canna, absolutely. And does anybody have any idea what this fungal disease might be? Sunspot. <laughs> this is rust, leaf rust. And so the top leaf surface, you would see what you see, the little yellow spots that you see on the left. Um, this is right outside the clinic. In fact, we finally removed all these poor cannas because they just always look like not great. <laughs> we left a few of them because I can always guarantee I can find this disease. And then on the underleaf surface, out of the sunlight is where the fungus erupts through the leaf surface and makes a powder that you can actually run your finger over and it'll look like you've been getting into the Cheetos. You're, it'll, it'll be rust colored, orange colored, and these look a little bit yellow because they're super fresh, but as it gets a little bit older, they'll turn more rust colored orange and then into like a brownish orange as they age. Plumeria gets more. this like crazy tail. You're absolutely right. Plumeria gets it. And Plumeria is, is so awesome because Plumeria is, is that Cheeto orange. And the only thing to do is to protect it with a fungicide before the symptoms start. And then if it's really bad, pick those leaves off and throw them away. Don't put them, you can put them in the compost, but bury them. Um, leaf, uh, rust doesn't survive very well um, in the compost pile. And they fall off anyway, but then they have the spores on them that can reinfect other things. So you kind of want to collect those and get rid of them. However, if you think it's pretty, which I do, let them rock and roll. Uh -huh, if you think it's pretty. Uh -huh. Well, I'm a pathologist after all. Exactly. All right. Is this a regular pattern or an irregular pattern? Do you see a recognizable pattern? <laughs> it's like Gumby. <laughs> What do you think this could be? What's the pattern? Regular. <laughs> Regular pattern, so abiotic. Any guesses? What is the plant that we're looking at in general? Grass. It's grass, absolutely. I'm gonna tell you this is on a golf course. Yep, Patricia, that's right, it was grass. And what are those shapes? What do you think happened here? Round up. It is not Roundup, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, think about how that would have to happen. Somebody would have had to like spray their feet with Roundup. Unless they really don't understand how to manage foot fungus, I don't think they're gonna use Roundup on their feet. What else might you spray on your feet? Or your legs? If Bug spray and sunscreen. Bug spray and sunscreen, that's exactly it. Both bug spray and sunscreen are carried in an oil. That's how they stick to you. Um, and that's how the substances that actually create the 
the repellent and the, the sun um, screen itself. And so what happened here is somebody sprayed the heck out of their legs, um, protected themselves from bugs in the sun and absolutely fried the turf, but where their feet were was saved. Wow, interesting. <laughs> All right, this one. All right, what's the plant? Oh, well, darn it. I forgot to take it off. What's the plant? Augustine grass. St. Augustine, St. Augustine grass. Yep, I gave that one away. Oops. What do you see for a symptom? This is right around the corner from my house. I'm in Gainesville. So it's St. Augustine grass right around the corner. What do you see there? Is that a regular or irregular pattern? Regular. Is it regular? No, I think it's ir irregular. James, I've got to agree with you. This one's pretty irregular. Those, there's a lot of it. It's a patch. It's some sort. Mm -hmm. Looks like it was much close. And it's sunburn. It does kind of look like sunburn. And that's a really good thing to be paying attention to. And if you can kind of look down that edge by the curb, you notice that it's sort of sloped over. Turns out that this yard has eight inches of thatch. And so when the mower goes down that corner, it scalps it right there. So it's stressing the turf. Mm -hmm. It's also mm -hmm. moving a pathogen. And if you squint your eyes or take your glasses off, you'll see that that edge is a little orange. And we looked, at some, we looked at some patch disease in turf, really closely mown turf that had a really nice orange edge. This is large patch. This normally we don't really see until the spring, um, but it's already cranking this fall. Um, and we only today are getting cool weather. This is unusual to see this early in the season, but we have just been so wet that the pathogen has taken off. So this is, so thatch, I have a good question. What is thatch and how to dethatch? So thatch is if you mow and mow and mow and mow, over time, especially if grass is like St. Augustine grass and you leave your clippings on, they build up. And depending on how much um, thatch you have, especially on grass like my neighbor here who does a lot of fertilizing, he wants that grass to crank. But what it means is he's got to mow two or three times a week during the summer. So he's building up a lot of growth and it packs down and it becomes hydrophobic, meaning water won't go through it and bugs live in there and fungus lives in there. And over time, it builds up and builds up and builds up. And so you know how St. Augustine sort of grows along the surface, the stolons grow along the surface. They just move up and move up and create thatch. So, so mowing too low um, is what made this really stressed, but dethatching, you actually have to rake it. Um, and it, it stresses the turf quite a bit when you do the dethatching, it cuts up the, the thatch and allows it to disintegrate and pull some of it out and you get rid of it. Um, you don't need to do it very often, especially if you're over fertilizing your So this is one of those where you prevent the thatch that prevents the disease if you just grow your lawn the way you should according to best management practices for fertility. Okay, what's the plant? We've only got a couple more of these. I think I'm almost out of time. What's the plant? Mm -hmm. Mangrove. Mangrove. Not irregular mangrove. pattern. It's an irregular pattern. That's right. These leaves, to give you some scale, the leaves are about that big, about half dollar size. So it's not mangrove. That's um, Indian hawthorn. Indian hawthorn. Very good. Bing, bing, bing. So this is entomosporium leaf spot on Indian hawthorn. Don't worry about the entomosporium part, except that that entomo part means it looks like a bug. And what looks like the bug are the spores, the fungal spores that cause this disease. Oh, so those so little funny. tiny leaf spots, round, so you know it's probably fungal. And this disease is actually what is keeping um, places like Publix and Home Depot from putting Indian hawthorn in hedges anymore because this will actually completely defoliate a plant because it keeps getting planted in hedges really close together um, that where it, water and moisture are maintained and often near overhead irrigation because when you're trying to irrigate a whole bed most of the time you're using a, a higher sprinkler right that's going to sprinkle on top that water then hits these leaf spots. And if you look really closely at the top left picture, there's little black dots in the middle of those black spots. Those black dots are pushing out sticky spores and the spores are contained in the water droplets from the irrigation and spread all over the plant. And over time, this will defoliate an Indian hawthorn plant. 
So you either want to plant a resistant one, and there are some with some moderate resistance now. Um, you can look it up online and buy those, or uh, plant something else. Fungicides are actually, you're going to spray a lot to be able to keep this one in check. All right, one of my favorites, the bots. What's the pattern on that poor tree on the left? Regular or irregular? Irregular. Regular. Irregular. Yep. The Botrysphaeria fungi, it's a huge group of fungi that are really bullies. They are made worse or really given an entry when there's wounding or drought stress, which doesn't seem like it would make sense. Like keeping something drier is going to be keeping the plant in a drought stress and then having it go through the summer of moisture means that something like Botrysphaeria really gets going because the drought stress is what sets up the conditions to be conducive for the plant to become diseased because Botrysphaeria fungi are around all the time all over the state and frankly all over the country. What you'll see are these anchors like the one that's in the middle. Um, you can see where the bark split and actually there's some ooze there this is one of those interesting ones where it's a fungus that produces an ooze. And it's not the fungus that's oozing, it's actually the tree. So that plant in the middle is actually a peach. Peaches are extremely susceptible to Botrysphaeria and are in fact, one of the most limiting factors in growing peaches in Florida. The picture on the right is what we call the wedge-shaped or pie piece shaped symptom. So this is when you cut the stem that's affected and dying back, you cut it um, crosswise, you're going to look for a wedge like this, and the dark part is where the fungus is. And Michelle, I'm going to ask if you can mute your mic, because what's happening is we're getting a little bit of feedback. All right, slime mold. This is hashtag not a disease, but man, we talk about it all the time, especially when we get a change in weather and we've had quite a bit of moisture. Slime molds grow on dead stuff, usually cellulose. Um, so anything woody, um, they're going to, to grow across it and they'll grow over living, right, dog vomit fungus. That's right, isn't that a fun one to talk about? My other favorite fungus to talk about is rat turd fungus or sclerotinia, but we're not gonna talk about that one today. Slime molds come in almost every color except blue. They are amazing, but they're just doing their job of turning your mulch into nutrition for your plants. So if your dog eats it, which they're actually really unlikely to do because it's powdery, so they might take one bite and be, that's it, they're not gonna do it again. Um, highly unlikely to actually make them sick unless they eat a lot of it and they're not going to do it. But if you really don't like the way it looks or it's getting on your shoes when you walk by, then you can rake it out or you can take a spade and go just underneath it, lift it out and put it in the trash if it's really bothering you. I have to tell you that it will go away in just a few days. And even if you think you've dug it out, it will be back because the spores are already in the mulch and frankly, they're all everywhere all the time. So better just to kind of appreciate them, think that they're kind of cool or ignore them. This is another slime mold and this one will look, so it's good. So yes, the slime molds are actually, they're sort of like friendly fungi. They're, they're doing a good job for us, like most fungi are actually, which are eating dead stuff and turning them into nutrition for the other plants. So this is a slime mold that grows on grass blades. And you'll see this one first thing in the morning. By the end of the day in the sun, it'll have dried out and you won't even see it anymore. But first thing in the morning, this one will be almost blue. It's really, really pretty. But the way you can figure out that it's slime mold and not a fungus that's actually growing inside the plant and attacking your plant is remember I talked about with rust, you can run your finger down it and it'll turn orange. Well, this one, if you take the grass blade and put a finger and a thumb and pull up on either side, it'll come off on your fingers and there will be no evidence of it underneath. Whereas rust, you'll still see where the pustule was that was producing the spore. So this is not a pathogen. Folks, you were really fun for participating, giving me your best guesses. Um, I appreciate that you laughed once in a while, even though my jokes are terrible. I know we all talk about dad jokes, but I have mom jokes and they're probably worse than dad jokes. So thank you, because mine are, mine are combined with plant pathology. Like, So hopefully sometime I'll get to see you up at the lab when life turns back to somewhat normal again and we can join each other in person or I can come down and I'll be able to see you where you guys are. I'm up in Gainesville on the main campus. Uh, most of the time my samples come to me in the mail or by courier, but we actually have a classroom 
in our that seats 24 people and we do hands on training in diagnostics with the dissecting microscope to get you comfortable with using that microscope and making the most of the tools that you have in the plant clinic. So that you can really help the clients that come into the office, but also helping your neighbors and the people that you see day to day and in your community. So I'm really excited about having you come up at some point when we're allowed to gather again. Right now we have no visitors allowed on campus. And I have to tell you, we pathologists, well, we're already pretty weird because you know we do plant diseases. We're getting really weird because we're getting lonely. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in person and getting to see you today by screen has been quite a bit of fun. Um, what you're seeing on the screen, of course, is what the disease clinic looks like, although that was the day it was built. Um, it has a lot more plants growing all over it now. And our Facebook page, you are welcome if you use Facebook to post pictures of diseases or plant problems you're seeing in the yard, and we'll try to give you our best guess. The other way to do that, of course, is to use DDIS and get a real diagnosis for it. Um, works not quite as good for plant diseases because symptoms only get us so far, but I can probably still tell you if it's fungal, viral, bacterial, or some other plant problem. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, I don't know if we're gonna take questions now or are we gonna hold those to the end? Yeah, Dr. Harman, I think um, maybe we could take like a quick question or two, but I think we will probably need to probably move on to the rest of the program. Does anybody have anything quickly that they would like to ask Dr. Harman? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. I think this group did a very good job of interacting throughout the presentation. So this was fabulous. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Harmon, for your time today. We really appreciate your time and expertise. Now we're going to go into our breakout groups for five minutes, and then we're gonna end with talking about pests and pathways. So um, for your bre the breakout leaders, you'll have five minutes to go through the plant disease activity. I think everybody's back together now. So we're gonna quickly go through the, uh, the last presentation, which is really to talk about uh, potential pests and pathways. And so uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun with this. I would really like for everyone to um, um, open up your chat and to chat, um, uh, actually, when you have questions, so I'm actually just trying to manage my chat so that I can actually see the chat also while I'm sharing my screen. So, um, there we go. So I've got that up. So if you keep your chat open, we're actually going to have an interactive part to this. So. When you look at the screen, the image on the left, do you know what this potential pest is? Or do you think it's a disease? You can type in the chat or you can speak up. Is it galls? Galls would be a good guess. And you often, you do often see galls on oak trees. But it looks lumpy. It, what did you say? It looks lumpy. Yeah, it looks lumpy. So I was really kind of focused in on this stick part. When you see like that, uh, like this um, symptom here coming out of trees, sometimes that is ambrosia beetles. A bark and ambrosia can sometimes do that. If there's something you do that. When you're not speaking mute, that would be helpful. So that when you see those like sticks coming out of the trees, those are signs of bark and ambrosia beetles. And oh. it, be clear, you might think that, well, it's some sort of disease or something else, but sometimes you'll see even more sticks, but that kind of like stick look coming out is a sign of ambrosia beetle. What do you see here with this? Do you know what tree this is on the right? Looks like a crepe myrtle. It is a crepe myrtle. And are you aware of anything that could be going on with crepe myrtle from this view? I know it's a, a, a further away view, so we've talked about this before. It's really helpful to get closer to the organism. So if you saw this, what, what is this? Do you know? Scale. Yeah, it's a type really of scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is actually crepe myrtle bark scale, which is occurring right now in Texas. It was first detected in Texas around 2004. Uh, but it's, it's really become a problem and it's really the first bark scale that has occurred on scale on, on crepe myrtle. 
And uh, it does produce um, honeydew. Not every scale insect produces honeydew in that black sooty mold, but this particular scale does. And so that's been pretty devastating in the areas where it's occurred. It's not known to occur in Florida yet. When you see the picture on the right, would you want to leave that scale or keep it and why? And you can type in the chat if you don't want to speak up. So I want to draw your attention to this um, in the center. Do you know what that is? So this is the scale all around. And most of the time when you see scale insects, and scale insects are some of our most problematic invaders because they're um, parthenogenic. In other words, the females can actually reproduce uh, without um, males. And, uh, and so it can really just take one female scale to, to start a population. So this is very good. So this is, Patricia mentioned, this is a ladybug eating the scale. And actually, if you see ladybugs um, or other natural enemies with your scales, you really want to keep those natural enemies there because if it's an established population of an insect, it may actually clean up the whole population. So this is what our crepe myrtle should have looked like. And just for your information, a couple of other hosts that we could be concerned about in Florida for this particular invasive species are uh, the uh, beautyberry, American beautyberry, cal uh, calicarpa, and also pomegranate. What do you see here on the left? What do you think this is? So where the finger is pointing. Could be a worm. That's a good, good guess that that could be a worm. Any other guesses? This is actually an oviposition scar. And the same thing that caused this, caused this dieback that we see here, uh, quite a bit of chewing and dieback. This is actually a damage from the Asian longhorn beetle. And uh, we do not have the Asian longhorn beetle um, in in Florida, but we certainly would want to know if you thought you, you, you saw something that looked like the Asian longhorn beetle. The Asian longhorn beetle is very characteristic. It has this uh, large black body. You can't really tell size from this photo. This beetle is about two inches um, uh, long and it has a black body with white spots and also the antennae have these um, white bands on them. They have very long white bands. And, Actually, this year, a population of uh, Asian longhorn beetle was found in South Carolina, and it's currently under eradication. So it really could be a potential threat uh, to us. And if you thought you would, you saw Asian longhorn beetle, you would definitely want to report it. And yes, this is actually a picture of the beetles mating in case uh, anybody was wondering, I noticed that in the chat. So how many of you have heard of the Asian bean thrips? You could type in the chat or, or do the thumbs up reaction. Maybe some of you have heard of the Asian bean thrips and some of you haven't, but this was uh, recently announced in Florida earlier this year. And it's a really major pest of uh, beans and uh, legumes and uh, and particularly, it's a bigger problem for snap beans, but it can affect other legumes as well as some ornamentals. Uh, but in areas where it's from initially, it can actually cause like a 30% crop loss. So it's actually uh, quite severe in terms of its potential um, pest status. And it also has a few um, orna ornamental hosts that it can uh, affect, such as uh, uh, that it can, but it's mainly a bean pest. So this is something to be on the lookout for. And I wanted to make sure that you're aware of the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry website, because that's really a great way to find some of the, the latest uh, pests that are a problem in Florida that have just been announced. So, um, so some of you have heard of it, some of you haven't. And so this is an interesting story. Would this initially cause you any concern if you saw something like this, yes or no? Uh, so, so this is actually, it's, it's uh, you would say yes. So this is actually another bean pest, but this particular insect can additionally get on some ornamentals. And this is called the Asian uh, black bean bug. And this is actually only the second um, member of the Platospidae that has actually been found in North America. 
And uh, one of my students actually found that this was in Florida by looking at iNaturalist and seeing that someone had submitted a picture of this on sea grape. And so uh, then it became a new continental record for actually finding this particular pest. Does this, this pest may or may not look familiar, but this is one that Jennifer talked about earlier in her presentation about DDIS. This is Tuta absoluta. This is a, also known as the tomato leaf miner. This is a pest that we're very concerned about from an international perspective because it can be so devastating for tomatoes. And from a size perspective, this little moth is only about two millimeters in length and looks very similar to a moth known as the tomato pinworm. And, and so with many of these insects, uh, it's really best to just go ahead and get that sample submitted and identified if you're not really sure what it is because they can just be so difficult and challenging to identify. And this is the um, horntail snail. Uh, this is also uh, a new detection in Miami-Dade County. All of the uh, new pests that I have shown you are, have actually been found first in Miami-Dade County. So we don't think they're in Martin County or St. Lucia, but if, if you were to uh, see something suspicious, you would definitely need to go through your county office and report it. But this is the FDAX link for the horntail snail uh, pest alert on this particular species. But actually, a, um, a, someone who is just a novelist who just enjoys uh, looking at working with uh, mollusks and snails, uh, discovered this snail and uh, then reported it and it is currently under eradication. It's a little different than the other snails that we have currently in Florida in that it has this caudal horn that you see here. So when we think about pathways, um, most of you probably already know that of course airports, that's one of our major ways that insects, pathogens and other things related to plants can come into Florida. This is a map actually showing all of our international pathways, uh, international airport pathways in Florida. And through some of these airport um, pathways, we actually receive a number of cut flowers and also vegetables. In fact, the Miami International Airport is number one in terms of shipments of, of cut flowers or vegetables. And although most of the distributors of the, these products really want to ship clean material, it only takes sometimes one little insect to then actually uh, arrive and, uh, and then it can be a problem for uh, our agricultural and natural areas. We also have 14 deep water ports. And so you can see where these are here. And that's um, another mechanism that both people, plant material and products uh, can come into Florida. And we have these interdiction stations. Probably everyone here has seen these interdiction stations at the Florida border. Maybe when you were moving to Florida, you saw these. And uh, when, when people are bringing in plants or food products, they stop at these interdiction stations for inspection to hopefully prevent pests from moving into the state. One of these pests that we don't want that is currently in California is the Bagrata bug. It's a very small stink bug that's a pest uh, primarily of crucifer uh, pests. So those are your uh, cold crops, your cabbage, your kale, things like that. And it's been intercepted numerous times at these interdiction stations. When something is detected at these interdiction stations, it is then, um, uh, that shipment is stopped and turned back. We actually have a small population of brown marmorated stink bug in Lake County, Florida. And this is a stink bug that actually uh, was originally detected in Pennsylvania and then moved further south. It tends to click, uh, really clutch onto vehicles. Some of you that are from the north may have even seen this particular stink bug overwintering in homes in the northeast or other areas where it's more prevalent. But we've had several uh, repeated introductions and that has resulted in a very isolated population specifically in Lake County. Not moving firewood is really important from a pathway perspective. It's actually illegal to move firewood just as um, it's also our legal requirement as Gen Jennifer mentioned in her presentation to report invasive species to FDAX. We also have a legal requirement to not move firewood 
over 50 miles from where we our campsites are. And so that's actually a state of Florida regulation as well. We have a group in Florida, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program, who is really detail oriented in terms of surveying for a number of exotic pests. And uh, they do a great job surveying for pests uh, by crop, looking for things that might be in the crop that aren't known to occur here, but they can't catch everything. And that's why we need you guys as the first detectors really reporting unusual things that you see because with a couple of the examples that I've already provided you, essentially hobbyists or homeowners are the ones that actually first detected these pests. When we think about things that could also be coming from California, which uh, Jennifer asked me to specifically talk about that as well, I wanted to bring to your attention, particularly some of these bark and ambrosia beetles, because they're so small and difficult to detect. This is a resource um, that's available uh, free online where it actually will allow you to identify or go through the process of identifying genre of bark beetles. But this is a very difficult thing to do because bark beetles are only a couple millimeters in size and there are hundreds of bark beetles and some of these transmit diseases. Some of you may even be familiar or you may have heard of laurel wilt and the red bay ambrosia beetle. That's an example of an exotic that has affected our red bays. And in the state of Florida, we have very few red bays left. And so this is a related beetle that has appeared in California that also transmits disease. We don't know what it's going to do in the long run. California has also had some issues with another bark beetle, uh, Euloasia fornicatus, fornicates. And uh, this is, there's a feature creatures on this particular beetle. And what you'll find interesting about this particular features creatures is that we have this in Florida. However, it looks like the population that is in California may be of a different genotype. And so that's something else that we have to think about in our pest identification and also how these pests are regulated when there is a different genotype of a pest that is causing major damage in an area that's reportable as well. And with that, I think we will end and take time for questions. I have a question. Hello, thank you for the great program. Um, I have yet on my palm. I know it's deadly. My neighbor started his palm and, and he, he, his Going to. Going to. So now I have now it on my reek is out front, and I'm trying not to let it affect the whole other side of the house. What do I do to kind of put a pause on this? I know it's bad. I got conks. conks. Oh, Jennifer, did you want to handle that? Let me unmute myself. So. Pat, you were trying to, I had a lot of feedback. So what, it's on your palms, the Ganoderma? It's on Eureka's. It started at my neighbor's and now it's affected all mine. I've cut back mm -hmm. most of it, but mm -hmm. they're slowly rotting. Is there anything I can do to pause that or? Well, it's the, your first step is when the conks start, the, the conks or the half mushrooms start to grow is you want to put a bag over those and rip those off and tie that up and throw those away because that's the, the fruiting body of the fungus and that's what's going to spread. Oh. Um, and, but it's spread through the air and that's the problem is that it's spread through the soil and through the air. But first step is to remove those conks so they don't, the spores don't escape the the fungus and spread through the air into Ooh, your, I did not know that. your plants. So that's step number one. Step number two is try to prevent any injuries to your current palm trees because this, the disease, although it, it's soil borne, it can be in the soil and enter through the roots. It can also enter through any wounds that you might have on your palms. So, but I, again, yeah, and there are Rikas, not one of my favorite, but they're my whole front of my house and yeah. I've already cut through the root ball. I mean, they're huge. I'll talk to you about it later on. We can talk about this in-house. Thank you. All right. Yes. All right. Sounds great, Pat. Thank you. That was, that was great. Additional questions. It looks like somebody has a question about Ligustrum dieback. I guess that depends on the causal agent and the homeowner situation, just like uh, Dr. Harmon mentioned. 
it's viral or bacterial, uh, then it's probably best to just remove the plant material. Uh, that, that's the unfortunate news for anything that's not fungal. And I, I think most diebacks are bacterial, but other questions? Okay, and some people don't have the surveys, so Shannon's also going to email that out to everyone. Really appreciate everyone's attention. Um, you know, we could keep talking about some of these things, you know, but um, hopefully you uh, heard about a few things that you hadn't heard about before. You started thinking about how to look for things in your yard. And when you do see something unusual, remember to submit it and work through your county office. So thank you so much. A big thanks to Jennifer. Jennifer, do you have anything to close? Oh. No, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, and to Shannon for setting up all the specialists and everybody to come, come together to teach us. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope that you gained some confidence on identifying insect and disease problems. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, just you can go ahead and ask me some questions, you know, and then Kate Rotendo up in uh, St. Lucie County is your master gardener coordinator. So hope everybody had fun. I know I did. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you guys and uh, yeah, just don't forget to reach out and uh, tell us about those weird insects and those beetles, those bark beetles I was telling you about, some of those are also parthenogenic. So they essentially can just produce males and then start mating with their siblings and spread. So those, those beetles are really complicated. And I'm going to definitely be sending those to Lyle and elsewhere if, if you have them. So that's why we showed you the insect identification lab information. So head is spinning, but, but, I, but I guess hopefully everybody enjoyed it. So. Yeah. Right, and we'd like to hear more if you if there's something we didn't cover or other feedback you have. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed your breakout groups. Um, and I'd like to thank all the breakout group leaders. Thank you guys. Bye.